Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Journey Latin America's Virtual Travel Club. This evening, we're heading to the fascinating island of Cuba, uh, one of the most musically diverse countries on the planet, where guitars outnumber MP3 players and singing is just another form of communication. But in all seriousness, uh, Cuba is the music in Cuba is just absolutely wonderful, and there's no way you can walk without stumbling across an impromptu band on a street corner. So. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a real, real highlight of any visit to Cuba. But apart from the music, there's also the fascinating history that the island holds. Uh, whether you choose to sip daiquiris in one of Ernest Hemingway's favourite haunts in Havana or trek the Sierra Maestra to Fidel's secret um, hideout, there's uh, lots of places to explore and to step back in time. But that's enough from me because it's not me that's going to be presenting to you on Cuba this evening. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Paul Winrow Giffen, one of our senior travel experts at Journey Latin America, and he's going to be taking us for a lovely tour all around Cuba. Uh, at the end of his talk, we're going to be holding a Q&A session, and I'm also delighted to welcome Jay Jamie Swan, our Group Tours Product and Operations Manager. And also, live from Havana, I have the pleasure of also welcoming Rory Nickel, an award-winning journalist and former magazine editor. So he'll be on hand to answer any questions that you may have about what Cuba is like right now. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Paul. Hello, everyone. Um, and yeah, I, as, as Laura said, I'm, I really want to talk to you a bit about Cuba. Um, give you a bit of an idea about you know, the sort of things we can we can offer there. You know why you might even want to get out there in the first place, and and what makes it such a brilliant and and sort of distinct destination, um, especially you know when, when thinking in the context of wider Latin America. So um, yeah, just wanted to to give you about a talk for about half an hour, forty minutes, and then we'll do some Q and A at the end. Uh, so let's just get into it. So um, just firstly, a bit about me. Um, I've been at JLA for about 10 years now um, and have traveled pretty widely across Latin America, uh, both independently and, and with the company. Got to see a lot of different countries, including Cuba, um, and have managed to travel you know, from, from east to west. Um, so you know, I think it's an amazing destination, you know, com complements really well with, with areas in the Caribbean and, and South America. Um, and, and we're always trying to sort of get out there as often as we can to sort of, you know, both enjoy ourselves and, and refresh uh, knowledge and get the, and the picture of things on the ground. Of course, the company has been operating for just over 40 years now. We, uh, we offer tailor-made uh, holidays and small group tours uh, across, you know, from Mexico down to Antarctica and, of course, to Cuba. Uh, and really, you know, all of the consultants here, you know, they know their stuff. Um, you know, everyone at, at JLA has, has lived or worked out in Latin America, you know, a few Latinos and Latinas as well. And really, uh, it's, it's about speaking to someone, you know, from the start to the end, you'll speak to the same consultant and someone who's been there and, and knows, you know, done the journeys, stay at the hotels and, and can just give you some candid firsthand uh, advice about the best way to go about planning a trip. The sorts of tours we arrange, as I said, we do group trips and, and tailor-made. Our, our small group tours, we have two of which go to Cuba. Uh, one sticks to you know, the western half of the island, and one of them goes the full length in a fairly fast pace, but varied trip. Uh, you know, smaller, smallish groups, you know, usually around 10 people, with, plus, a, plus a tour leader. Um, and, and, you know, it can be really as flexible as possible with, with add-ons, extensions, you know, um, you know, anything to, to work around what you want to do. And then you know, for the full customized experience, uh, if you've got an idea about what you want to do, or even if you don't, we can just you know, just design a trip to suit you uh, based on you know, working around the pace, your dates, you know, whatever, your, your, mainly your interests, whatever you want to do. So you know, a lot of variety here at JLA and hopefully find something to, to suit each one of you. Um, a bit of the kind of admin stuff, um, getting there, getting to Cuba, really easy actually. Um, have Virgin now operate um, their direct service aboard the comfortable Dreamliner three times a week from Heathrow. Used to be out of Gatwick, but now it's from Heathrow, just 10, or 10 hours and you get on London, get off in Havana, you know, really, really convenient. Um, there are regular other departures via Europe, so you know lots of different options, especially if you're coming from a regional airport with someone like I Iberia or Air France. 
And Lufthansa uh, recently have also started operating flights out to um, Varadero, which is primarily a beach beach resort on location, but could be a nice place to come home from rather than having to, you know, get back to Havana for your flight. So just a, a, a brief touch on the airlines, but, you know, the favorite has got to be the Virgin flight, just makes it really easy um, and uh, just takes the hassle out of getting there. And so when you want to go, um, in the Caribbean, you know, realistically, the, the, the most popular time to visit is, is going to be that, that time from December to May. And that is primarily due to the heat, the humidity and the, you know, the wet, wet weather that you can find, uh, particularly in September, October. Um, you know, June to November, well, not so good. You know, I wouldn't have any problems going away in June, July, even August out to, the, to, to Cuba. It is going to be hotter, perhaps a little less comfortable. So just worth bearing in mind. Um, and I wouldn't get too put off by the measure of rainy days that you see on a lot of websites as, you know, in the tropics, it simply measures it if, you know, if it rains for an hour that day, that counts as a rainy day. So it could be beautiful sunshine for 90% for of the time you're there. Just be a bit more careful about September, October, maybe the very beginning of November, which um, yeah, is the hurricane in Caribbean and you, know, you can get those tropical storms rolling through. So to get into the mood of things a little bit, I've done a bit of the, the, the admin, uh, just a, a short video, uh, a bit about Cuba to yeah, get us into the spirit of things. Cuba 
es auténtica. So, um, I, I love that video. I think it's, it's a really nice introduction. Um, really brings the spirit alive a little bit, not just of, you know, Cuba's history, but of the people. Um, and really, a few of the things I want to talk to you a bit about today. What I've decided to do is rather than just sort of having a geographical uh, presentation about Cuba, about the different areas, I want to talk about, you know, what is awesome about it, what I really love about you know, going there and what I think you'll also really like about it. So um, these are the main topics that I think really excel and, and that you know, Cuba does, does amazingly. Uh, it's worth sort of digging deeper once you're there. So just going through them. Um, actually, before I do, just to back up the video, just a few more shots of, of Cuba, just to show how, how beautiful it is, what a you know, fascinating place it is and and you know, get an idea of the history so you've kind of got the streets of old havana you know a kind of a mixture of re restored buildings that have had work done to them and, and money you know thrown at them and then you know often just behind them it's a, it's a dilapidated shell um which you know it's it's part of cuba um it's part of havana and you'll, you'll see it throughout but it's uh, some beautiful parts and then some parts that have, have gone through a bit of ruin but it's it's all all part of the experience um, like the picture I've got behind me, the, the, the fields and pastures of Vinales. Um, we've got these giant limestone magotes kind of creeping out of the clay colored soil. And, and you know, this is a beautiful, lush part of Cuba. Um, you know, not really necessarily thought of for its natural side, but a really nice area to get out to, to learn more about the, you know, the plantations out here and really just to go on walks, hikes and enjoy it. Got Santiago de Cuba out in the eastern side, um, kind of the second city of of Cuba. Again, it's a, it's a bit more edgy, a bit more sort of Afro Afro Caribbean influence here, but still with a strong Cuban identity and some beautiful colonial buildings. A real, you know, really different to the the feel of Havana. So nice to have a contrast between the two. Of course, Cuba's uh, Caribbean beaches. Um, even if you know, even if your focus for your trip to Cuba is the history, the town, the cities, you, you can't sort of deny that going for a few days out to a coast, maybe in a resort, would be a nice way to wrap it up, or, or just even to begin the trip. So, sort of definitely consider that when you're when you're out in Cuba. And just finally, you know, just a picture of you know just what you can see when you're on the streets. You know, the Cuba, the classic cars. Um, in contrast to the colonial history is it's just absolutely beautiful when you're out there so um a map of cuba we've got i, I know a lot of the names are very small so i apologize for that but i'll just quickly give you a, an overview um so cuba is roughly the same length as the uk um i'd probably say that some of the roads are uh, you know, really not quite as good um you've got the one main road that goes the, the length of the island uh, and then of course you know lots of other smaller roads but that's the main one you'll be traveling along um and you've got vinales and las terrazas out, out here to the to the western side which was where those magotes were and then as you head out to the east from havana you've got Cienfuegos, trinidad you've got santi spiritus uh, you've got some the beaches along the whole northern coast up here and then you then once you kind of get out to this you know, to the eastern part of Cuba, you've got Bayamo, Santiago de Cuba, Baracoa, the Sierra Maestra, mountains, you know, a lot out to the east as well. So you may have heard more about the West, and, and you know, those are the places that have you know, had the wealth and been more focused on. But I you know, I really think that for a trip to Cuba, if you've got the time, if you can spend two, two and a half weeks, three weeks out there definitely get out to the east as well you know try and see both ends of the island it's where there's been less development you know there's fewer tourists out there and um you get as i said a super contrast between what you find in the west and the um the history and the current situation of how how life is in the east so talking about the history of course cuba's full of it it's got really interesting and you know, peculiar history really it's so so strange what's what's happened in Cuba from an international standpoint and um, of course on the ground over there you know from the people living there it's been a, a crazy a crazy experience um, of course in, in all the big cities you've got relics of the colonial it's colonial history you've got 
the town of Cienfuegos, which is very much French neoclassical architecture. Um, there's a real variety around Cuba, as I said, in various states of you know, condition and, um, and renovation, but it's you know, you, undeniably a historic place. And then you can get to the smaller towns of Trinidad, like the top left photo, where it's just cobblestone streets with beautiful houses and, you know, shops and bars and re restaurants. And it's just a really nice vibe and very safe to get around these places. Um, so, you know, while it's what you can find in a lot of colonial towns and cities is that, you know, they're, they're deserted at night, but that's not the case for Old Havana or you know, the streets of Trinidad. So great to wander around, great to explore. And of course, you know, Cuba's revolutionary history, which I'll come on to a bit, is a, a really strong uh, identity of, of the country as well. So definitely, you know, for those of you considering Cuba, I imagine you know, history is probably the, the main reason to get that many want to go. You know, you won't be disappointed. Uh, the music, um, you heard it in the, in the video, I mean, you'll see it on the streets, they'll, they'll, you'll see it in the shows, the, it's everywhere really. Um, it's, I really like the Cuban music, I'm a terrible dancer, so, you know, you'll get to strut your stuff when you're there, but it's, it's definitely everywhere, there's all sorts of, of different sort of types, particularly sort of Cuban side genres. And um, and yeah, you, you've you've got the, the sort of dancing and the shows. I mean, there's a there's a lot of different uh, ways you can experience it there. One thing I would recommend is definitely in places like Vinales in Trinidad, you get out to the Casa de la Musica or the Casa de, de la Trova. Quite low key, you know, relaxed places. Live, often live music. People just getting up and dancing. You know, order yourself a Cuba Libre. Uh, the rum's delicious and, and absolute bargain. So, you know, kind of soak up the music, but alongside, uh, you know, alongside the locals as well. And it's easy to do. You don't need to go out of your way to do it. A bit about um, you know, things we know Cuba for, um, you know, other than its history, it's you know, famous for its tobacco and production of cigars. So, you know, I don't smoke at all, but it's still fascinating to learn about, to get out to the Vinales, see the, yeah, firstly, the colors of the plantations and see the people working the fields, the, the, the huts where they dry the leaves, of course, the rolling, you know, there's lots of different facets to it. And it's really just intertwined with, with Cuba's history. So really cool to, to learn about, to see. Um, and then that's the same with the sort of the rum, the sugar cane, um, is a huge export of Cuba. It's big business there uh, and, and you know, something to enjoy as well. So make the most of it while you're out there, you know, learn about it and it's, it's the best time to do it. And of course, you know, some of the music again, you know, basically like the, uh, people like the Buena Vista Social Club come out of Cuba, done huge things for, for Cuban music. Um, you can head down to La Torrena in, in Havana and, and listen to some, you know, some great, great Cuban tunes. As I mentioned before, the Caribbean coast in, in Cuba is just stunning. And yeah, it's what it does tend to be is it does tend to be resort based. So there's, there's no denying that, you know, it's, it's not really a historical experience going to the beach here, but it actually does really combine well and contrast well with you know, the way the places you'll be staying in the trip. You know, you'll often be staying in, you know, converted colonial buildings or, or you know, hotels, uh, maybe Casas Particulares. Um, so it's quite nice to finally, you know, spend the last few days at a resort where there's a few more facilities, pools, you know, you could eat on the site. So it's just a nice contrast and uh, making the most of being in the Caribbean. Great snorkeling out there, clear waters, uh, and just the beautiful white sand that you, sh you should um, come to expect. And of course, um, Cuba's, Cuba's revolutionary history, which is so cool to learn about when you're there. Um, it's is so interesting and really has shaped the country hugely. So, you know, both you know, from internally and, and from the embargoes that have been in place um, on the country as well. So it's really fascinating to learn about, to go to some of the museums, learn a bit about the Bay of Pigs. We've got the Moncada Barracks down at the bottom left and out in Santiago de Cuba and the, uh, the, more, the Che Guevara Mausoleum and Memorial here in Santa Clara as, as well. So, 
there's loads of focus on this you'll you'll see you know revolutionary art and, and paintings and graffiti all over all over the place you know just learning about this is the the main square in in havana where you know where sin fuegos and, and castro made speeches it's it's you know, really interesting to learn about and you know nowhere else will you get a better understanding of it than than when you're in cuba and can see the areas and, and get out there uh, and one th one other thing i really like um when i was out in cuba i got out to eastern cuba this picture in the bottom right here absolutely stunning nature and this was taken on a um a hike out in the sierra maestra mountains um that's kind of out near bayamo and you you basically hike moderately difficult you know three to four hours in total and you, you hike up to into the mountains where essentially the the revolutionaries were, were camped out for a long period of time in in hiding really and and broadcasting their radio propaganda and trying to recruit you know support and and um, uh, members to the, to the army and the cause uh, so it's just fascinating to learn about that get to see where it all took place and um, and just again you know soak up the story uh, that little bit extra And I, when I travel, I really like to get off the beaten track as well. And I think what's important to, to bear in mind is it can can definitely be done in Cuba. I mean, Cuba is is a place that's it's not you know, booming tourism. It's not you know, flooded with U.S. visitors or anything like that. So it's definitely possible to get to the places where you know you can you can get you can feel there's there's fewer visitors it's you know more authentic experience i appreciate that word is battered around quite a lot but um you know i think you know more than anything you'll find that in the east of cuba as as i mentioned uh, and would urge you to get out there uh, if you can you can see you know, quieter beaches up near the town of hibara which you know, is a, a colonial town but you can get out to some amazing you know, deserted beaches there's no infrastructure or anything but it's it's you know, fantastic yeah you can get out get out to baracoa which is this picture in the central bottom again a coastal area you know really just out on the tip of cuba out people out there go hiking walking and just a, a more laid-back experience i think as well all lower key so definitely think about it um and if, if that's your sort of style of travel then then i think cuba would be well suited to you And uh, people, um, I mean, this is this is of course what really ties it all together. Um, the stories, the, the the people going about their their own business. I mean, on the roads, you'll just see everything from people driving these wagons, horse-drawn carts, and oxen, from trucks and buses, and you know, there's really you'll really see everything. Um, and you know, everyone's up for a chat. There's pretty good level of English actually among among lots of the sort of locals you know in Havana you might get asked which football team you support you know there's some of the standard questions but you can you can definitely um definitely sort of you know glean a little bit of a uh, of the experience and, and knowledge from from the locals and it's you know everyone's actually surprisingly friendly despite you know having a probably a reasonably difficult life and there's some there's some real stories in there as well. I mean, um, we're in this top left photo. We're having a we're whizzing around Havana in, in a classic car, and speaking to our driver, he was uh, he was actually a doctor, a GP. Um, however, because of the way the payment structures are in Cuba, and I don't know the, the exchange rate with the US dollar, various things, uh, he was originally just doing the driving the classic car around and picking it doing a few rides on the side however now it's become his main main source of income because because he gets much more money for, from it than he does from from being a doctor for the government so you know he still does a bit of both but it's it's just interesting stories you know just having a guide who's who's um you know fully qualified doctor is just quite you know just really throws into perspective how how crazy life in cuba can be And that kind of leads into you know what I think about Cuba today, and you know what why I think you should really it's just a brilliant time to get out to Cuba. Um, as I said, it's you know, particularly now, of course, with with COVID, but also um, just in general, Cuba is a place that's really beginning to open up. Um, you know, the, the termination of the embargo and, and more accessibility to Cuba is only going to make it a more more and more popular destination. So it's definitely 
a good idea to to visit to see things you know as they currently are which are you've got that really great middle ground between you know, a country that's been cut off for so long and a but a, a of time to visit where you can have you can actually get wi-fi in some places so we're actually being able to connect with rory uh in a little bit straight from havana which you know five five years ago might have been pretty difficult uh you know supplies and water things like that are very easy to get a hold of these days so um it sounds you know sounds obvious but actually those things you know in cuba are not necessarily straightforward so those getting those kind of practicalities down and, and smoothed, smoothed out is really nice and allows you just to sort of relax and enjoy your time out there. And I think as one of the final points is just talking about the, the nature of Cuba, which often does get a bit forgotten uh, ahead of the, the, the history and the revolution. Um, it's a huge island. There's, there's lots of different climactic zones and, you know, it'd be, if, if you do like keeping active on your trips there's hiking there's kayaking there's there's riding as you can see there's agro agro tourism and you know there's a few different hikes the one i mentioned out in in near the sierra maestra mountains called comandancia de la, de la plata up to the uh the revolutionary camp uh this this mountain in the middle of the screen is is el yunque which is a tabletop mountain out in the very far east um, you've just got some amazing scenery that can be reached on foot or, or you know, by bike. And of course, you know, not, to, not forgetting the, you know, the seas around the island as well, which you know, not only for snorkeling, there's, there's diving out there, amazing marine life, usually not from the shore. It's the sort of place you take a boat, boat trip out from to, to get out there to the best sites, but really, really worthwhile, really re rewarding and just kind of ties in another facet um, of the trip to, to your time away. So just a couple of um, couple of notes about a few you know, unusual things about Cuba and you know, getting around and being being in Cuba. So when, when traveling to Cuba, you'll you'll definitely notice you know, these things called casas particulares. You know they'll be everywhere really, and um, they're they're essentially sort of B and Bs that are run by you know the locals. They what they tend to do is open up you know a second. So it can be a second or third room in their house, but it's usually an adjacent building where they have a, you know, one or two or three extra rooms and they've converted them to guest rooms. And now they, uh, they actually work really, really nicely as, as accommodation for, for our guests. Um, so really the way it works is, you know, many, many of the larger hotels in Cuba have, have been government, government owned for a long time and they just have a slightly different feel about them. I definitely recommend staying at least one or two while you're when you go out there to get the sort of the regal, you know, historical feel of some of these buildings and, and you know, learn about their stories. But also highly recommend uh, visiting, staying in you know, a handful of Casas Particulares, um, as these are really good fun. Um, you get a bit more interaction with the locals without it being overbearing. As I said, you're not you're not staying in their, in their front room or anything like that. You've got your own space, usually your own entrance. You've got you know, it's very simple amenities, usually AC, you know, fan, uh, some places, you know, a safe and, you know, some usually an ensuite actually as well. So they're, they're perfectly comfortable and you're always in a good location. They've always really central uh, and surprisingly the food is actually a real, a real plus point of these places because they're not, they don't often have large restaurants. It's just home cooking, good food, you know, big breakfasts. Um, so you're yeah, really, you know, a plus point in Cuba and and you'll definitely be seeing these places particularly in you know the rural parts where there are you know very few other hotel options they're a real real lifesaver and often the best place to stay in in some of the smaller towns so you know don't be you know don't be put off if you see these creep into an itinerary they're actually really really good and again you know see a different side of Cuba when you're staying there and We've talked about staying um, now on the move. So getting around Cuba, there's, there are a few different ways to do it. As a company, we do arrange private transfers, which is probably the most straightforward and means you can just, you know, forget about it. You forget about the journey, talk to the guide. Um, just, I like to have a few of those in the trip, particularly on arrival from the airport, just to get your bearings, you know, just feel comfortable. And it's just the most relaxing way to do it. Um, we do also recommend hiring a car out in Cuba. 
Uh, it's definitely for the, those of you a bit more adventurous. It's um, you know signage isn't great in Cuba. GPS can be quite hit and hit and miss. Um, so I'd, I would recommend uh, if you do hire a car that you maybe have a basic grasp of Spanish at least to try and help out in case you need to ask any questions. Uh, but you know if not, you've always got uh, our contact numbers. You've got we've got a team on the ground in Cuba, so you know, we're not talking any drastic trouble you you get into, but just to really help you help you along the, the journey. So can be a really nice way to do it. You know the drives are fairly you know aren't too long. The longest drives you'll probably be doing are maybe five hours. So long, but you know, not unmanageable. And then, um, you know, there's there's options for you know other sort of sh tourist shuttles around, which work really well. Economical, you know, fixed schedules. So you can weave those into a trip if you're looking to keep costs down. I did part of the reason I wanted to talk about this was to talk a bit about the public transport and particularly the coach network in Cuba, which is. I think it's quite attractive. You know, I was I was quite keen to to travel on them and see what they'd be like, uh, as I'd heard quite a lot about them. You know, one one of the companies called Via Azul. Um, I wouldn't really recommend it, if I'm honest. Um, you know, over the past kind of fifteen years, ten years, the, the maintenance history and uh, of the of the buses, and really just the response times of the company running it are are quite poor. So there's been a lot of reports of buses breaking down and being stranded or stuck for a long time. And really, that's not what you want on a relatively short trip away in Cuba. So uh, I'd probably stick to the, the top three options and that'll give you more than enough choices to get, get around Cuba. Not to forget where you are in the world. Um, Cuba combines really well with, uh, with, with Panama, um, direct flights from Havana. Yeah, I, I, I had no real, real sort of preference about going to Panama, Panama City um, before visiting, particularly, you know, to learn about the canal. You know, I thought it wasn't really my thing, but uh, it's, it is undeniably an awesome place. Um, you must see the canal when you, if you go to Panama. Um, and it's just learning about the engineering, the bleak history of it, seeing the huge Panamax freighters go laden with all the uh, all the cargo as they dwarf everything around them. You know, it's a really, really cool site, even if you just get spend a few days in Panama City um, and then sort of come home. It's a great hub for flights. Of course, Mexico, just a short hop over to Cancun. Again, usually direct flights out of Havana uh, to see sort of all the Mayan temples and, and pyramids. New, new, uh, and new um, direct flights from Havana to Lima in Peru. So you know, why not tick off one of the biggest highlights of them all in South America, Machu Picchu, uh, reasonably easy connection. So yeah, just have a think about it. If it's been on your bucket list, Cuba, P Peru, could be, it's an interesting combination and, and could, could work well. And then just a few other Central American destinations, which I think would be nice combinations, um, though you'd probably need a connection via Panama to places like Nicaragua, Belize and Costa Rica. So um, I'm not going to read out all these bullet points you'll be pleased to know, but just wanted to say that you're really booking, booking with us. You know, for me, the most attractive part of it is you're dealing with you, you know, typically one person from start to finish. They, they know their stuff. They've been out there, as I mentioned at the beginning. If you, even if we're not talking Cuba, we're talking Antarctica, you, you call, up, call up someone and say, I want to speak to someone who's been to Antarctica, no problem at all. So. You know, the whole idea is an ethos is to speak to someone who who can really give you some first-hand advice, help you build a really exciting trip to to suit you, and then um, and then really sort of you know whittle it down to to the you know, perfect itinerary, uh, and then really with you from you know, up until you travel, and then still contactable all the way through the the holiday. So real start to finish uh, assistance and uh, by people who know, who know their stuff as well. Um, a quick plug for our, our new app as well. Uh, this is just something you'll get booking with us. It just means you've got this to load your itinerary onto. You can um, have real-time maps, weather, and you know, share photos and things like that. So um, it's really, really nice. And I particularly like it for the, uh, <laughs> the very simple countdown feature at the, at the start of it, which you know, sounds like a small thing, but it's actually a really good uh, feature to, to get you excited about the trip you've booked. Um, before I before I finish up, just want to let you know about um, our next virtual travel club. If you enjoyed this one and your you know, Colombia's on on your 
your mind. Come join us on Tuesday, the 27th of April at seven, uh, seven o'clock. Uh, my colleague, uh, I think Lena will be talking about that. So yeah, come, come along, um, listen in and uh, yeah, learn a bit about Colombia. So that's it from me. I hope that, that was um, you know, informational. Uh, I mean, I think just what I want to get across is I love Cuba. Um, I think yeah, I think many of you will absolutely love it as well. It's a really varied destination, loads to offer. And, um, and yeah, it's, as I said, it's a great time to, to be getting out there. That's fantastic, Paul. Thank you so much. That was a brilliant presentation. And I'm sure all the attendees tonight really enjoyed that uh, tour of going around Cuba. Um, we've had a few questions uh, pop up uh, throughout your talk. So I thought um, it would be nice to introduce Rory now. Um, as well as Jamie, so um, they're on hand to to help answer some questions. And I think before we sort of tackle the sort of the nitty gritty about travel around to Cuba and money and travel, car hire and transport, um, maybe we should talk about the COVID situation. I know that uh, Havana or Havana, Cuba was put onto the UK's safe travel corridor. Uh, I think it was in, as early as August last year when uh, when the system was uh, recently introduced. Um, and certainly that's very positive news and it sort of sends lots of signals that Cuba will be hopefully opening up very soon. Um, but what is the current situation, Rory? Can you tell us a little bit about, um, we know at the time we needed a, a, a PCR certificate uh, on entry. We had to, uh, you had to wait two days uh, to, to prove that you had a positive test, but um, perhaps you've got some further insight on that. <laughs> yes, um, in fact, oddly, I, well, while Paul was talking, I was being asked by the neighbouring table about it um, because I'm on a, I'm on a rooftop in a, one of the fanciest hotels at the moment. But the um, a, it's quite interesting at the moment. The, the, the because tourism here is people won't know this, but actually, as a tourist coming here, if if you stay in hotels, you only have to quarantine for two days, and then um, and then you can travel. If you, you can actually rent a tourist car and you can go anywhere in the island, which Cubans can't do. But you have to stay in the big hotels if you're going to do that. If you want to stay in Casa Particular, you have to quarantine for six days. You've got to have a PCR test when you arrive. And then you have to have a PCR test on day two, when you get, uh, sorry, on day four. And then when you get that, um, as a result of that, you are free to go out. Um, so, at the moment, in terms of COVID itself, um, they were doing incredibly well until Christmas, and they were really only getting tens of new cases a day. If that they were down to one or two at one stage. Then at Christmas, they because of uh, economic difficulties, they allowed a lot of Cuban Americans back in to see their families at Christmas, uh, which was obviously a kind thing to do, but did spread COVID quite far and wide and. Um, a, so now we're seeing sort of between 800 and 1,000 new cases a day, which is nothing to the rest of the world, but it is um, it's significant nonetheless. And and so we're in a sort of semi-form of lockdown. I'm on, as I say, I, I can have lunch on this hotel rooftop. There's a couple of other places to eat, but uh, the, as Paul was saying, the music is what it uh, usually when you're here. The music is literally everywhere. You can't. I mean, you you don't you. You're never out of the sound of music, wherever you are. In my house, it's it can be quite annoying sometimes, but on the whole, you just get used to it. But um, so the music venues are shut, the nightclubs are shut, there's uh, the you know um, bars are shut. But it's actually oddly not a bad time to visit. Fantastic. Thank you, Rory. That's that's really helpful and really insightful. Thank you very much. Um, Laura, I want to, can I give people a quick sort of visual tour of where I am of, of Havana? <laughs> Please do, because I want people to actually believe you are in Havana. So do, do okay. go ahead. So I don't know if you can see. Can you see behind me? Yes, yes, we can. Right. So over there is the Capitolio. Looks exactly like the US Capitol was built to look like it in the 20s. Um, if you look down there, you see the square and beyond it, you see the Grand Teatro, which um, is now named after the great Cuban ballerina, Alicia Alonso. 
Um, it's very, very Baroque. Baroque. Next, you see the Hotel Inglaterra, which um, for students of Graham Greene's Old Man in Havana is very important. Across there, you see the sea looking extremely nice. And the Foxer building in the distance, which is where all the Russians used to live during um, a, when they were really held the whip hand. Um, you can't see, the, oh, you can just see the Havana Libre Hotel where Fidel had his first um, headquarters here and was the Hilton Havana um, until the revolution and had just opened. And um, a, uh, if I just quickly take you over here, there's the, um, the beautiful, beautiful art museum here, the Manzanas. This is, I'm in the Kapinski Manzana. I wanted to do this rather than from home, just so you get it. This is a pretty spectacular um, a rooftop. Um, and if you come, I'll try and see. No, you can't. Yeah, you can. You can just see. I don't know if you can see behind me. In Savannah Bay, where, where um, in the olden days, the Spanish would hold all their galleons, all their treasure ships from Latin America. And they would come here and hold, hold them all up. And then they, and then they would take them over in a vast convoys to avoid the um, wolves in the, uh, wolves along the way, who were basically the British and the Dutch who kept trying to steal all their ships and their gold. So that's, there you go. <laughs> That was lovely. That was a brilliant tour. Fantastic. We, we all believe you are there in Havana. And what a treat to see uh, the city looking so glorious in that beautiful sunshine. Um, I'm afraid I finished my pina colada, so I can't show <laughs> them here. Now, now you're making us all very jealous. Um, we've had a few questions, actually, Rory, on money. And I, I think, Jamie, as well, if you'd like to pitch in as well. Um, this often comes up. What's the best uh, currency to take? Is it is it because I know that ATMs can be a bit unreliable in Cuba. Uh, what, what's your opinion, Rory? Um, actually, I find ATMs incredibly reliable. You just need to know which ones to use, which hopefully um, uh, well, I'm sure JLA can, uh, JLA can tell you and uh, also your hotel people. There's one here on Prado. Um, I, until quite recently, I just, I just, I live here and I used ATMs all the time. Um, so as long as you don't have an American card, don't come with any American technology. It's just, it's really difficult. So as long as you've got a European card, a British card, it, they work, they tend to work pretty well. Um, <coughs> I, things have changed, as you may have heard. Um, it used to have this completely incomprehensible double, double, currency where there's local worked on pesos and then the tourists worked on something called the Cuban convertible pesos which is was linked to the dollar then slowly over the years it was introduced in 2004 and slowly over the years <clears throat> locals started using CUC to get anything that was out of the ordinary so sort of um, shampoo toothpaste all that sort of thing um, then just before Christmas they decided to get rid of the CUP the, the CUC and now we've all gone to the pesos. This has led to a black market for the first time I've ever seen in Cuba of, of currency. So there is now, you get 24 pesos to the dollar, about 30 to the euro pound. And um, uh, I hope I'm not saying things that are bad here, but you will get about 45 pesos to the dollar on the black market. Um, now, I would be careful as a tourist here coming and trying to change money. You might get yourself in very bad. I would be careful of doing it as myself. But um, I would say it's worth coming with euros as well. People will love you if you've got euros. Um, if you can pay for things in euros, then they will really, really love you and probably give you a big discount. So I would bring a cash card and I would bring some euros. That, that's really helpful. Th thank you. And J Jamie, I, I, I assume that's the same case. Uh, that... Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything I can add to that, really. Um, as Rory said, I think the important thing is to go with some cash. Uh, I, fa I found, as Rory said, you do get to learn which cash machines are reliable and, and, and your guide who picks you up from the airport will often point out one or two near the accommodation, as will the hotel. Um, the airport, actually, to have the some... airport as well. Yeah, um, and it, but it's always good to have some cash uh, just in case you can't find that ATM that's working. Um, 
just small things like that. Just be a bit, bit more prepared than you might be at home. I, I travelled to uh, Cuba, I think it was in 2003, 2004, so uh, clearly some time ago. And, and obviously uh, the experience of withdrawing money has definitely changed. So uh, I definitely need, uh, I'm long due a visit, let's put it that way. Um, yes, come on. <laughs> I'll be there on the next flight. Actually, talking about flights, we had a question. Are, are flights, they have an airport, uh, international airport, opened, I believe, at the end of November. Um, are flights from the UK still operating at the moment? Are we still, Jamie might know as well. Are we? Uh, I, I don't think so. I haven't actually checked for a while because there hasn't, we haven't been asked to do any. Um, but as far as I know, they're not, um, I mean, there, there are still flights going from the UK, of course, but they are generally routes that are considered more sort of vital business routes, which I don't think Havana is. Uh, so I don't think they are flying. And if they are, it's, it, I mean, people still are not advised to be traveling at the moment anyway. So, uh, you need a reason to travel. Great. I, great. I, I think, I think they will open up as soon as. As soon as allowed, Virgin will start flying again, uh, like they did last last year. Um, so it's, it's still um, possible to you. Know, you can already book future flights at the moment in Cuba, true, so, for yeah. Cuba. I mean, you know, flights at the end of the year are available to book. You can book flights already for next year. I was holding off some uh, the other day. Um, and things are actually getting fairly booked up already for January, February, March next year. You know, like premium economy, things like that. So. Um, yeah, I mean, we, what we can do is we can always hold off flights for you without, without commitment at all. So we can secure spaces, secure prices for you. Um, and then so if you do, you know, if the trips are able to go ahead and you know, are able to travel, then, you know, you, don't, you haven't had to uh, you know, pay a deposit or anything like that to the, towards holding the flights necessarily. And then if we, you know, if we do need to postpone or cancel the trip because of, of COVID, then what it means is, again, we haven't committed to the tickets. We're not trying to you know, claw back money from airlines. So it's kind of a um, win-win, really. The, um, Virgin is taking bookings from May, June, but I wouldn't trust it for a moment on that. Um, a, uh, we've been uh, offered tickets all the way through this, which then are cancelled um, because people are adjusting the airlines quite rightly are adjusting I like having money just to keep themselves going. So Virgin are taking bookings from May, June, but I, they haven't shown any signs of actually beginning to fly. Um, you can fly through KLM and Air France at the moment and with the area, but it's really once a week. Um, and obviously you'd have to tell um, the authorities at the airport why you were leaving the country, given that they're charging people five grand if they're caught going on to I mean the British. Yeah, that, that, that's right. There is that, uh, that, that fine in place at the moment um, on banning uh, uh, non-essential travel. Um, sticking with transport, we've had quite a few questions on car hire. Um, is it possible to hire a 4x4? Four four? Uh, is it essential to hire a 4x4? Four four? Um, uh, Jamie, did you do a 4x4, four four, uh, sorry, a self-drive when you were in Cuba? Uh, I didn't. Um, I, but they obviously it, it 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 can be done, and it's it's an increasing way to visit the country. Uh, one of the issues with the with the cars is is the importation of cars into Cuba, and there was just there's more demand um, than there is supply uh, when it comes to comes to sort of self drive vehicles. The 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 supplier of them is generally kind of government run. Uh, although there is a bit of privatization creeping in and, and some an entrepreneur or two might um, import some cars, but relying on uh, or, or wanting to, it's not as, it's not like other countries where if you book a four by four, you can guarantee it. So it's, it's tricky that it's tricky to, to guarantee and to promise exactly what you, that that's what you'll get. But saying that you don't need a four by four anywhere. There's not really, there's on, on the self-drive trips, there isn't really anywhere you go that, that it's a necessity. Yeah, in fact, we introduced um, a COVID conscious trip uh, not, not that long ago, actually, uh, which Rory was fortunate enough to fortunate enough to travel on. Um, and, and Rory, I know you were keen to travel on a four by four because you were wanting to get off to the off the beaten track destinations. Perhaps you've got some uh, an opinion on what uh, self drive is like and and car hire in Cuba is like. That you know, just normal vehicles. Yeah, I hope I wasn't too happy about that. Look, it's like I want 
for my ball. Where's my ball? My ball? I want my no, ball. No. <laughs> no, but you had you had uh, <laughs> other reasons, which is fair enough. Um, a, uh, yes, I did that trip. I did that trip just before it opened up in November for the Telegraph. And um, a, in the end, I didn't need a four by four. And actually, subsequently, I managed to get them to get someone else to give me a four by four. And actually, the four by four was pretty rubbish compared to the Peugeot three or four or whatever Laura got me. And um, I, I, I didn't have any problems at all. And I swear I took it as off road as I could possibly go. I mean, we did have to turn back once when we came across a flooded river. But other than that, it was, um, I really wanted to see the real backs sort of roads. Cuba. And what I discovered, because I've lived here three years and becoming since 2004, um, a, what I discovered was the first time I properly took a road trip with me behind the wheel. Previous things, uh, previous times, Laura's organized things, and that it, I've gone by cab and things like that, is that self drive here is magnificently good fun. Really, really brilliant fun. Um, there's no cars on the road because, uh, um, as Jamie was saying, there's uh, very few cars are imported. Um, and a car costs way more than a house. If I, I, I'm looking to buy a car, and if I wanted a terrible old larder here, terrible, 1970s, terrible larder, it cost me 25000 If I wanted anything good, it would cost me 50000 So very few people have cars. So the roads are empty. Um, a, there's lots, there are potholes. Um, there's car, there's there's what they call calatons or caratons. There's um, horse and carts. There's um, pedestrians. There's uh, hitchhikers. There's lots of animals. But it's the roads are actually remarkably good, remarkably good, and it's really good fun. And I would recommend it fully. I'd only say one thing: never ever drive after dark because all those things I just mentioned don't have lights, and that's when it becomes very Right. Other than that, it's a terrific way to travel, and you don't need a four by four. Or I could have gone to Laura very kindly organised the trip to El Micho, amazing waterfall in the Escambray, which is probably my favourite place in Escambray, Cuba. And um, she organised a four by four to take me with a guide up there, and I could have got there very easily. During Latin America, I could have saved myself a bit of money. So the roads are. Uh, it is no, it's not a big deal. Uh, Rory, how about the railways? Um, I know a long <laughs> time ago, we, we used to, on our, on our parakeet group tour, and I'm definitely going back about 20 years now, we used to send passengers on a, on a train going down to the yeah, east of Cuba. I've done it. Yeah, is, is that now in operation? Or, I doubt it, but yeah. yeah um, it was a scary old train journey back then. You used to have one carriage, it was air conditioned to the point of being a sort of meat freezer. <laughs> and then you head down to Santiago on this thing, and uh, with the rumor ringing in your ears that farmers, because it was illegal to kill cows, farmers couldn't kill cows here because the girl wanted the milk for the kids. Um, so there was this rumor that the farmers would tie their cows to the railway lines so, and let the train, the night train carrying the tourists, kill the, tra the cow, and then they wouldn't be sent to jail for killing a cow. So. Um, uh, that rumour in your ears as you went down in the thing. But, um, no, it's sort of fallen apart, but there are rumours of it coming back. Trains are, are, the Chinese have sent a whole bunch of carriages over. There is talk about repairing the rails. There are now local trains, but I believe you may know, I'm sure you may know better than me, but I believe it aren't allowed on them yet. I'm desperate to try it again. Um, a, I was looking into actually doing a rum tour by train the other day, but I can't work out how to make that happen. But I would say it's looking better, but at the moment, it would be so lovely to be able to travel to Santiago on the train. It would just open up the whole of the East to me and mean that you wouldn't have to do those basically a whole day's drive. To yeah, the tricky. Th I think the tricky thing with the trains, uh, in addition to the the stories, is um, sometimes it's it's difficult when you've got time in Cuba. You know, there's a few more avenues open to you, but if you're if you're out there for ten days or something like that, and you're trying to fit things in, you know, this, I, the the train schedules can be fairly unreliable or can be subject to to last minute changes, which I think is the nature in Cuba. Um, you know, Cuba definitely suits 
a fairly flexible traveler, you know, being quite open. And while it does have you know, these days, it's got some fantastic new hotels, including the Kempinski where R Rory currently is. And there's got some really nice properties, you know, a lot of a lot of Cuba and the way things are run aren't necessarily, you know, a match for that. So um, it, it's worth sort of traveling to Cuba with that in mind and, and trying to keep positive and, and you, you know, you'll be re rewarded for it. Thanks, Paul. Um, from transport to food, um, I know that uh, Cuba doesn't always have the best reputation for food, but um, perhaps uh, you can offer us a bit of an insight of, you know, wh where, where is the best place to eat? We had one, uh, one person ask us, should they be eating in a restaurant or should they best eat in a, in a casa particular? Um, what, what's your recommendations? Who are you asking? I was asking Paul, but uh, okay. Rory, go ahead. Um, well, I think you eat in both, really. Um, you're going to find if you stay in Casa Particulars, you, um, you, a, a, you will probably eat there at night, so you'll get very good Creole food. Now, but you know, it's chicken, rice, and pork, beans, you know, that's what you get. Um, in Havana, there are now very good restaurants. I wouldn't recommend eating in the hotels particularly but i think um especially if you're in japan there are actually some superb restaurants now. um superb is in the cuban context bear in mind you know, so we're up to london or new york standards um but a there's places like rio mar there's la corte de principe there's lots of uh, very good restaurants and then there's i mean i constantly would love to see some of the old classics come back there's a sort of pre-revolutionary classics right uh, there's a famous soup, which they threw everything in. And it's, uh, uh, there's fun things when you're traveling, like um, on the trip that Laura organized, I went to a place called Isabella de Sagre, which is this little place on the, on, um, on the edge of the sea. And I had the most amazing seafood there, just some of the best I've had in the world. Actually. Fresh seafood, if you can get it, it's amazing. I think called the ostiones, which are clams and tomato sauce. And I've eaten all these things and I've yet to get sick, which I find quite remarkable because I get sick very, very easily. So there's, um, I think you just mix it up. There is, the food is famously, has been famously bad for years and years. I mean, the critic A.A. Gill once refused to refer to it as food. He said for the whole article he wrote the word do. So D-O-O-F rather than F-O-O-D, um, because he said it would be opposite of food. That has um, changed now, that has changed. It's actually, it's really quite, it's, uh, yeah, I, uh, we eat well. Yeah, I think um, also with, with Cuba, it, it's important to remember you're in the tropics as well. So you know, there is access to a really good fruit, um, you know, which is, a comp you know, you're going to have fruit every day for breakfast, at, at, you know, at least the choice of it. So definitely, um, you know, always remember that, you know, very the sweet sweetness of pineapple doesn't taste any you know as good as anywhere well basically it's, it's always the best in the tropics you know close to costa rica cuba so you know always remember that uh, and like rory said there is you're, you're going to get your fair share of you know a bit of chicken ham and flat with some beans and rice but um you know i think you cuba you know there's, there's probably the slight downside that it's not doesn't have quite the variety of other places but you can definitely still find some some great food out there um and i would also yeah also suggest eating in both the government run hotels because sometimes they or not the hotels sorry some of the restaurants because sometimes they can have some just lovely terraces you can be on the plaza mayor and you can just have a great spot so you know enjoy it like that or you can go to the, one of the homestays um often the the restaurants of the homestays are called paladares and you can just get some fairly simple simple fare um it usually tastes tastes really good you know of course much better value perhaps than eating in one of the larger restaurants um and um i think one thing that's always a surprise for me is a uh, it's a surprising amount of lobster on the menu in cuba and it's it's delicious as well so i don't i don't know <laughs> don't know how they how they manage it but it's so you can really treat yourself to a lobster dinner every night if you wanted I was going to say that as well, Paul, is, is yeah, I, after a week of eating lobster, I actually <laughs> wanted something else. You think you're never going to get sick of it? You do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel very sorry for you, Jamie. It was tough times, yeah. 
The, um, just what Paul just said about fruit is absolutely true. The first mangoes arrived yesterday, and then we'll get the avocados coming shortly after, both of which are totally well to us. Great. Well, that, that's fantastic. I'm sure that's whetting most people's appetite right now. Um, OK, so last couple of questions before we have to wrap up uh, tonight's event. Um, we've also been asked a little bit about the Jazz Festival. I think that takes place in Havana. Uh, Rory, do you have any information on that? Does it take place? I think it's in August, the annual Jazz Festival. Yes. Uh, is it August? You probably may know better. I'd have to look it up. It's definitely worth coming to, though. God, it's so worth coming to. Whether it will happen this year, I don't know um, yet. Um, it requires people to fly in from all over the world. The festivals here are amazing. People come from all over the world. And um, a, I imagine something local will happen, but it depends, I suppose, on whether the, the venues are open. You'd have to just keep an eye on that. But um, I would recommend it. It's unbelievably good. That's great. And if somebody wanted to attend the jazz festival um, and they wanted to base themselves in Havana, um, are there many, I mean, maybe Jamie, you might be able to help us or Paul on this, is, um, are there any day tours? How, how far realistically can you see Cuba, the rest of Cuba, uh, just from Havana? There's a few, but it's going to be tricky. Um, so realistically, you can go to Vinales uh, from Havana on a day trip. But even that, it's it's probably it's a while since I did it. Uh, two hours each way driving, two two to three hours. So half your day is going to be spent driving. So once you get there, you'll you'll have a quick tour and uh, some lovely views and a spot spot of lunch. But you're not going to uh, your best spending a night there at least. Uh, in the opposite direction, things are generally a bit further away. Uh, you've got some beaches you can get to within an hour or two, even Havana's got some, some beaches uh, sort of 30 minutes away. But to get to some of the other colonial towns and cities, Cienfuegos or Trinidad, you're, it's, again, it's, it's three to four hours from Havana, really. So uh, you've got the chance to get some nature and, and some beaches, but that's other cities or towns are a bit too far, really. I think um, what I would suggest for for those of you who are looking to you know not be living out of a suitcase, I mean, you know, just something like a three centre trip would be really really good in in Cuba. I mean, one of my favourite sort of short itineraries is you know get to Havana, arrive, have a few days, soak it all up, enjoy, recover from the flight. Um, and then get on the road out towards Trinidad. And while it's a long journey, you know, perhaps break it up with a stop in Cienfuegos en route, you know, have lunch and then carry on to Trinidad. Good few days in Trinidad to kind of do the same, again, recover from the journey. And then maybe from there, head up to the north coast towards the beaches, you know, via Santa Clara, check out the Che Guevara Mausoleum and Memorial. You know, so you're kind of t ticking a lot of different boxes en route. You can even, you know, finish up just a few, yeah, you know, a beach just a you know, few hours away from Havana, and then, you know, for the flight home, it's an even overnight flight. You just, you know, have the morning free, head back to Havana, jump on the plane, and get back. So, you know, three centres, not too much packing and unpacking, and you, I think you'll see, you know, a lot that Cuba has to offer. Um, just on the jazz festival, it's actually I, I, I was, it's in it's January the eighteenth to twenty third which is actually a brilliant time to come. So um, I would, and hopefully everything will be clean and open by then. So it's, um, it's actually that coming for the jazz festival would be amazing. Um, there's a film festival in December as well, which is very, very good. The, um, I just add to what Paul was saying in that don't, don't go small on the time you spend in Havana. Havana is one of the cities of the world, which is constantly exciting. Um, yeah, don't don't stint on your timing. That's very sound advice, and, and thanks for checking on those dates for me, Rory. Um, okay, well, I think we're going to have to wrap things things up now this evening. So I just wanted to thank our panelists, Rory from Havana, uh, Jamie Swan all the way from uh, I think from South, South London, South East London, <laughs> and, and, and of course.
course, and of course, Paul, who's who's given an outstanding presentation, a really, really insightful, very, very thorough. I, I'm hugely appreciative to all of you, and I'm sure that all our attendees tonight are going to be sending you lots of very warm thank you messages. So, um, uh, thank you, everyone uh, at home watching us this evening. Um, it looks like we're, you know, spring's on its way, just about. Uh, and we're a little bit closer with the vaccine rollout and hopefully some good news of when we can all travel again. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. And we do look forward to welcoming you again on Tuesday, the 27th of April, where my colleague Lena will be talking to us about Colombia. She's from Colombia, so she is the best person to talk to us about the region. So um, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody.